Hello and welcome to A Critical Dragon where I talk about narrative in film, television and in books. And I am joined today by one incredibly special guest and that would be Joanna. Hello, Joanna. Yay, hello. It's my first time on your channel. I'm so excited. And I am also unfortunately joined by the evil nemesis himself, Dr. <laughs> Philip Chase. Hello, Philip. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, whoever got you that, that that's a terrible thing that they did. I know, and they're probably regretting it to this, at this very minute. I do. Um, <laughs> and so You just need to grow your mustache long enough to twirl while you drink it. <laughs> just, just for men. You can, you can get it all, like, dyed in so it actually has color in it. Yeah. What, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> I'm clean shaven. Oh, Mr. Babyface. Okay. Uh, right. Sorry. With with that diversion yeah. <laughs> over and done with. We are we are here to talk about um <sighs> No. Well, it's the same book. I mean, it's it's Warhouse of Vastmark. Warhouse of Vastmark, which is the second half of right. the first edition of Ships of Merrier by yeah. Johnny Wirtz. So yeah. it's the end of the is it the second arc, and in depending on which edition you have, it can be the third. Oh, that's better. Yeah, yeah. there we go. You well, look. aren't you fancy with actual technology? <laughs> <laughs> um, go on. So the third book of the Wars of Light and Shadow, or book two point five, uh, if you're kind of in the original first edition printings in the U.S. edition, is not how it works. Roughly, yeah. So, I mean, I think that Jenny Wirtz herself considers Warhost of Vastmark to be part of Ships of Marior. Um, I, I believe she has said something to that effect, but that they got separated in the, the paperback in and also in both hardcover and paperback in the UK. They're separated, yeah. something along those lines. But in this edition, uh, the hardcover in the United States, they are, as she conceived of it, one book. So, yeah. And the first discussion that we had was on Curse of the Mystery. And Philip, that was on your channel. And then, Joanna, you hosted us for Ships of Merrier. Or, right. well, now it turns out the first half of Ships of Merrier. So, <laughs> Philip gets a full book. And, Joanna, you and I have to split a book between us. Yep. Do, do you see why he's the nemesis? I, I see now. It was all Philip's evil, maniacal plan. <laughs> All along. Um, so, John, why don't you you start us off on this? How did you fit? Because we'll have a, a general sort of non-spoilery kind of discussion about the, the book in general terms. And then there are certain sequences and scenes that were quite impactful to me for a variety of different reasons that I thought would be nice to talk through. So, John, what were your, your general uh, non-spoilery thoughts about this and, and what it was doing? Oh, it was so impactful. There were so many beautiful scenes in this book, just gorgeous descriptions, but also just heartbreaking scenes as well. Um, I really loved the amount of subterfuge in this book. There was just a lot of trickery that I felt quite deceived by, <laughs> and it made me feel very gullible as a reader, but um, just beautiful moments overall. I, I enjoyed this quite a bit. Mm. And Philip, as an expert on subterfuge and, and being a nemesis. Yeah. Well, I'm in my element here, I suppose. I, uh, I This was a very satisfying read because it, it is, as you mentioned, the conclusion to arc one. And uh, I believe that Jenny Wirtz has separated this 11 book or 10, depending on how you look at it, uh, book series uh, into these separate arcs. And so this is the uh, the end of an arc uh, and it was a very satisfying conclusion uh, with a lot of payoff from the uh, Curse of the Mistwraith and Ships of Marior. And if we're talking about Warhouse of Vastmark as a separate book, uh, there's a lot of payoff from those two earlier books in terms of characters that I was kind of annoyed with uh, in the first couple of books. And in this book, I felt a little more understanding toward uh, and even kind of started to like even. So there was some of that. 
uh, I, I, I think it came to a very satisfying conclusion uh, that still leaves room for the rest of the eight books in this series. And we're getting the last, the 11th next year. Uh, so uh, I, I feel like it wrapped things up in a way, very satisfying, no real cliffhangers. And yet I'm eager for more to come. And as Joanna said, uh, as usual with a, a Jenny Wartz book, my experience has been such uh, a wonderful time with the rich prose, uh, the wonderful descriptions. I, I cannot read these books quickly because they, first of all, they're just so rich. Uh, and I, I, I want to savor the sentences. I want to enjoy myself while I'm steeped in this world uh, which is just so elaborately portrayed. And there are so many aspects to it. So when she talks about sailing, when she writes about sailing, Jenny Wirtz sounds so convincing. And when she talks about horses, she obviously knows what she's talking about. And that attention to detail is uh, quite stunning. Um, and so I, I just feel like this is such an, uh, uh, I, my expectations with each installment keep going higher. Um, so I'm really please with uh, this uh, conclusion to arc one and eager for more. Johnny, you mentioned there, uh, you know, feeling that you were almost like a gullible reader because you've been fooled and, you know, things had changed. Do you feel like, do you feel hard done by that this was a, like a cruel trick or is this the sort of excitement that you feel that there's a sudden revelation and you re-see things in a different light? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, there were a couple of moments that I have in mind where I think it was almost meant to be funny and I felt fooled. <laughs> so I don't know. It's not quite that kind of revelatory experience, but there were certainly a lot of scenes like that for characters and uh, characters recontextualizing or reframing or re-understanding things with greater context uh, that changed the way that they perceived other characters that I really found fascinating in this book as well. So I guess that's what I'm kind of alluding to in a non-spoiler way. But also, I mean, just the epic elements of this story just continue to awe me. The magic, the, I think what you said, Philip, about her prose just being so, it's so vivid, it's so beautiful, and it just adds so much to the settings, to the world, to the magic, um, to, to so much of the history and lore of the world too. And there was something else I was gonna say too about that. Oh yeah, prophecy. I also really enjoyed in non-spoiler way, the way we have prophecy woven into the story. It was one of the more unique ways I've seen prophecy woven into a story, which I'm sure we'll talk about in the spoiler section. Yeah. One of the things that like I have just loved about this series and, and works as writing in general, the the variation now it's all definitively her style but mm -hmm. the variation in the tools and expressions and the techniques she uses are context dependent so you know you have sequences that there's a lyricism and rhythm to what is on the page and it fits with what's happened and then suddenly there are more staccato harsh anglo-saxon consonants being thrown in for something that is content dependent. And she moves between these effortlessly. It doesn't feel jarring because each time it, it what is being expressed is being expressed in the overall style. And it just, it seems so seamlessly done. It's so uh, conscientiously done. And that command over the the written word on the page is just something that every once in a while I just have to stop and go back over a sequence because I, I've just moved through it and gone, oh, this was brilliant. And then I sort of, it's almost like my editing brain kicks in and I want to go back to see how she managed to do that. And it, that is just something about these books. In, uh, in addition to the what is happening in the story what the the revelations are the events that occur the characters that we're invested in it's how this story is expressed is just one of those things that i i'm riveted by and i just so i just wanted to agree with both of you about you know the, the things that you're talking about but this is this additional element to it that 
I just can't get enough of. It's funny the way you describe that, because of course, a lot of literary terms or literary technique terms are similar to musical terms. And there were actually specific scenes in this book that felt to me like they were operatic. Like I could see it on stage. I could hear the music. I could hear the key modulate at certain moments at like the perfect moment. And it just built so much tension and excitement in me. I just, oh, I could definitely see this adapted as an opera. <laughs> Just want to say that. <laughs> That's a wonderful insight, actually. I love that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so now, now that we've had a, a general sort of uh, non-spoiler discussion, because let's face it, we're three books in. The chances of people wanting non-spoiler stuff I mean, is minimal, but it's it's nice to have it there. So why don't we move on to more sort of spoilery discussion? And um why don't why don't we start with obviously one of my little uh, idiosyncrasies of talking about prologues and the openings of things because I I will admit now on camera what I admitted to you both in private but I I will admit to my mistake what is the name of the wizard and what do I call him in my head <laughs> um, it goes You're well talking with about Haradmon. And you call him cardamom. I call him cardamom too. Every Card time I read it. Because <laughs> he's a little bit spicy. Yeah, <laughs> it's perfect. Uh, I admit it. I am sorry. It's not my fault. Names get twisted in my head. Characters get renamed. And then when I don't have the thing in front of me, I reach for the name and I get the what I've called them instead of what they were in the book. So I apologize in advance if I call Caradmon Cardamon. I don't mean to. <laughs> but what did you think of this whole sequence of because this was this was something that had been uh, alluded to that was going to happen. Um, there was tension about where he was and, and what what was going on? Why, why he hadn't reappeared? So, Joanna, like, what did you think about this this sequence? Um, it was interesting. I felt like um, it unfolded in a way that it was giving you little bits and pieces about the curse itself, and I guess their whole purpose or Cardamom's purpose was to to figure out the name of the mystery. That was the purpose. Was that your understanding as yeah. well? And so I guess there's a lot of weight put to names and I guess a lot of power in names is what I'm gathering from that. Uh, Philip, what, what about you? Well, I would say, actually, I would go as far as, as to say that this prologue is probably my favorite bit of writing by Jenny Wirtz so far that I have read, actually, uh, including the standalone to ride Hell's Chasm and the three books so far in uh, Wars of Light and Shadow. I loved this prologue and I loved the whole book, but this prologue was just so crazy. And so, I mean, I just loved the way, you know, I, I felt like I was beginning to piece together some of the way the magic works, but also they're doing new things here in front of me. And it was so tense and so, uh, well, well done. I mean, with with uh, the way that uh, I mean, it was so clever the way they resolved the issue, uh, ha having Seth Veer put his his uh, spirit into these two pebbles yeah. and shattering one of them and having it go all over the the uh, the place, and having the race have to chase those all down, and then tying that to the, his spirit that he'd put in the other pebble, which was put in the vessel that, uh, now it wasn't, it was um, the other in, in corporate one, uh, Luhane. Luhane had made a, a kind of out of the table, I think it was a granite table or something, had made a vessel to contain the pebble. And so it was just this, I would never would have thought of anything like this in my entire life. I thought it was just, just the most creative most uh, fun and vivid and intense uh, scene uh, that I had encountered. Um, and, and I was really not quite sure if uh, Seth Beer was going to get out of this one or not um, and was somewhat relieved at the end of the scene. Uh, so yeah, I loved it. I really loved this part. That was like splitting consciousness. Like 
That was yeah. so interesting. Yeah. Because one of the things I, I liked about it was not only is it a greater insight into how magic is is working in this world and the different relationships. But if you think about it, this was a little tiny, very domestic scene. And yet the repercussions, the ramifications of it is um, galactic. It, it It's bigger than the planet itself. And so we get this movement between that sort of macro scale of threat to what, what seems almost like three doddering old men, two of them ghosts, kind of running around in a study and there's dust everywhere. That the almost the absurdity of that, and yet the scene was highly emotive and emotional. It was impactful. It it had stakes, it had threat, and it had tension running all the way through it. And what when you think about it, it is it's it it's people sitting in a study. And having tea. Yeah. <laughs> and yet it, it it suddenly took on all of these these different aspects. And I think that shows that you don't necessarily have to have giant mage battles mm. to create really powerful, engaging and enthralling sequences that that get across the threat, that get across the stakes, that can have the the reader immersed and engaged. And you know, that's it, again, it's one of the reasons why I love this writing so much. That Wurtz is that's writing, awesome. she, she's able to convey this. It's such a brilliant way too of catching the reader up with what Cardmon has learned on his mission, which was after all to learn what is what are these wraiths, what is this threat that we're and and it is rushed right into your your face as the reader as as he's fleeing for his very existence and he's there scrambling to try to help him. Uh, I just I loved every bit of it. Yeah, but I, I also quite liked almost the humor of um, uh -huh. it's like why didn't. Why didn't you answer our call? It's like, I was being chased by those things. Like, yeah. I was busy. It's the intergalactic magical phone is for my convenience, not yours. What have you <laughs> And in fact, it was their call unknowingly that endangered him. Um, so he, he, he was put in quite a difficult spot. Yeah. And that's why when you're creeping through enemy territory, you should always have your phone on silent. Yeah. Or on vibrate. Yeah. Good lesson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um so any anything else about that particular sequence because I, I, I philip you you touched on a really good point there which was the the expository nature of it of getting that information across but again integrating it into the action into the narrative catching the reader up in a way that wasn't previously on wars of light and shadow last week this is you know it, it wasn't bald faced. It was integrated into a very natural form. And again, that it's one of those techniques that I love and I, I appreciate. So that's clever. That's making me appreciate it even more, just hearing you two talk about that. Um, I think one thing I've said over and over again about what I appreciate about Jenny Wirtz's writing style is I appreciate the way that she's able to gradually increase the stakes in her stories. So it starts off fairly high, but it, somehow she manages to amp it up little by little by the end. And this kind of starts with the blast. It's a little bit of a different approach for her, but I also really appreciate what you're saying about the context that they're in, you know, these men kind of having tea around a table <laughs> in a sense, but we're still revealing what's at stake and how dangerous this uh, curse really is. Yeah. Um. Well, one of the the sort of the next things that I, that I wanted to talk about um, was, I suppose, uh, Arathon and Dakar trying to heal Jillia. Is it Jillia? Mm, yes, correct. Yeah. yeah. Because this this was a sequence that was heartbreaking in a number of ways. Yeah. Because you know, we, we've had that they fight off the wyverns. Um, they rescue her. She's still breathing. She's so badly hurt. Um, Arathon still can't use his magic properly, but can use his his bard powers, use the music to guide the magic. 
Dakar is there to, to twist and, and help this. But it still leaves the decision up to her. And for her to accept the healing because of it needs her consent. Right. She would have to reject the actions that had resulted in this. And those actions meant so much to her. They were her freedom. They were the thing that she wanted to do. They were her joy. And so she denies consent and dies. And that was so heartbreaking for me because you, all the way through it, you want her, you want her to, to say, yes, heal me and to be saved. But it goes to the heart of, but to do that would be to deny her very essence. And it shows the, the power of agency, but the cost of it here and the cost that magic has in this world, that it's not a simple case of just waving your hand and wishing it so. And so that, that sequence was, was really quite upsetting for me. Um, mm. Donna, what do you think? Well, I, it actually reminded me a lot of, so there's a person who, um, in my town who works with, uh, Raymond Moody, who's an author of near death experiences. And I saw, um, I actually went in person and got to watch him talk and it was really interesting. But, uh, so I heard about all these different NDE experiences that have been reported whether or not they're true or whatever, but um, it sounds very similar to some of the research I've heard about those and the idea of choice and of like of choice whether to go on and die that maybe on some plane there could be an aspect of choice and looking at different parallel possibilities, which is which were introduced to her through the magic. But what I thought was interesting, at least in this fantasy world, we could just put that kind of topic aside, although I would be curious to see if Jenny Wirtz found influences from that um, in those kinds of things. But I, it did feel to me as though on that plane, because it seems like there are different planes or different lanes, I guess is the way it's described in this world. It made me wonder if somebody, if a character possibly has more, more agency on certain planes, like on certain types of levels where they're able to see these different paths and make that choice and she made that choice it was incredibly heartbreaking it was incredibly heartbreaking because like you said it went on for a bit of, for a while and you you as the reader just wanted her to make that choice to come back and she didn't but she did so I think she also left there was like a beautiful way that she described that passage of her soul too I don't know I just find those other like I said those other planes really fascinating too so just on that level of the world building really incredible also just the way that the magic was described in that particular scene was just beautiful just another <laughs> another example of Jenny's beautiful prose and and again I think part of it is is taking something so small like Gilead is not a major character is not someone who we knew even basically before this sort of small sequence of events and yet we become so deeply invested in her choice because we, we see what it is. We see what it means. And it, it really was, that, again, that using that micro scale, that small scale event to show the, the big metaphysics of the world, to look at some of those big questions about what it means to make these choices. What are the repercussions and ramifications of this choice not just for her but for her family yeah and using that very small scene that moment explodes out into all of this other meaning and understanding that permeates our reading of the text mm. yeah i mean it also it's something that we grapple with in our real world too like how do we how do we come to terms when a child who is so full of life, so full of potential just tragically dies? Like, how do we come to terms with that? And it feels like that's a similar journey in this world or a similar exploration in this world of how they're making sense of that, but also with the, with the magic at play as well. 
And it's also a moment in which Arathon and Dakar work together or are they, yeah, they have to come together for a common cause, which is probably not what D Dakar wants to do, but. Yeah, that's what I was going to say about this scene uh, because we have the, the poignancy of Gilead's death, uh, which is uh, tragic and difficult and in some sense beautiful too uh, because we're seeing the essence of this little girl and, and, and it's beautiful um so there's wonder in that but another uh source of emotion another way that uh, jenny Wirtz evokes emotion in this scene is the fact that dakar is for the first time realizing what arathon is and what his compassion means and he is this is the beginning of dakar's journey in this book of changing the way he views this person that he had basically regarded as, as his nemesis and uh he he wanted to be with lycer lycer was his chum and he he sympathizes with lycer and, and thinks that arathon is the is a a real shady character as it were um so <laughs> master of shadows um so i i really feel that there's a lot of emotion here in Dakar's sudden epiphany about Arathon and doubting all of his held, previously held notions about this person that he's been shackled to. And, and this is the beginning of Dakar's empathy toward uh, Arathon. So that there's another a, a very emotional scene, really. All of this really interweaves. And we have to keep in mind too, that part of the tension between them, right? It, the One of the reasons or the main reason that Dakar is against Arathon has to do with the death of the children, of children, right? In book one. As he perceives it, yeah. I feel like that was just perfectly plotted by Jenny Words. Like she knew what she was doing, putting that scene at the beginning and making them come together in that way, especially knowing how, how Dakar's journey transforms in this book, the questions he has to face in himself, the truths he has to look at. And, and actually, it connects to one of the, the other sequences, which is when Lysair goes to uh, the the hostel, the temple of Ath, yes. that, that, that to where Philip had said about the prologue, just this once, I'm going to talk about it. I, I prefer this sequence to the prologue, wow. but only because this sequence in, in the hostel was so brilliantly done that Lyser has a chance at salvation, a chance of forgiveness. He gets to see the truth of things. He's in this magical reality that has been constructed through faith, through belief, through the magic of the world. And he rejects it because in order to accept the forgiveness he would have to accept that he had done something wrong in order when he is confronted with that vision of what he actually did without the sugarcoating of self-rationalization, self-justification and the curse itself sort of inoculating him from what he did. He is shocked by it. And he has a choice. He has a choice in that moment in this beautiful, wondrous reality to accept that, to heal. And he rejects it because it would be against who he is as a prince, who he has been trained to be as a prince and ruler, what the, the, the curse is making him do. And the fact that this would be an admission that he has committed these terrible crimes and the fear associated with that of having to admit that you've done that and live with that guilt. Mm -hmm. It's easier to believe the lie. It's easier to believe that you were justified. It's easier to buy into that because as long as Arathon is evil, as long as Arathon is the enemy, then I was justified in what I did. But if Arathon is not evil, then what I did was a horrendous crime against these innocent people. And 
that entire sequence where this salvation is offered to him and he cannot physically, mentally accept it. And that, to me, again, emphasizing the, the deaths of the children and the women, but emphasizing the choice in all of this. He chooses not to accept. And that's why that, that particular sequence um, I had bookmarked because about the magic, the wonder, the awe, the mystery that was all tied up in going into this building that suddenly you're, you're in this magical realm based on belief and faith and prayer and all, all of this wonder together. This moment where he, he steps up and, you know, the story could end just here if he, if he accepted this. But again, this focus on, on agency and giving people that right to make their decision and not forcing them. And the heartbreak when Lysair refuses and turns his back and leaves. Yeah. This is my favorite scene in the entire book, mm. honestly. Uh, it took my breath away. I, I think it's some of the most beautiful imagery, some of the most beautiful writing. It's definitely some of the most beautiful writing I've ever read in fantasy, maybe ever. <laughs> I thought that, and what you're saying, EP, I think it was set up again so beautifully. I have to go back to like how we start this scene and how we build to that decision and that choice because this description of this setting, I'm just uh, trying to look through a little bit here. Here from no source, the eye could discern lay an ice pale twilight, all silver and lavender and the deep leafy mystery of an enormous stand of trees. These were not scrubby, storm tattered hardwoods, nor the palms of the skim laid peninsula, but a patriarch, but patriarch trees with towering high crowns and trunks as broad as the reach of five men. I mean, she just goes on and on. And it is so beautiful. It is the most gorgeous description ever. I was just like, this is why I read fantasy. I read fantasy to to visit scenes like this that I could never I could never see in the real world that my imagination could just take me there with her prose. Um, but as, and it was so inspiring. It was so beautiful. It was like a heavenly realm. And I, again, kind of going back to what we were saying before about uh, Julius, Julius's decision. Mm -hmm. Thank you to, to pass on. And I was saying how it almost felt like in this otherworldly realm or lane or whatever, almost like choice was something that you could you could discern a little bit more clearly um, than maybe you could in the more normal plane or normal world. But to me, even though we're not in one of those maybe specific types of planes, um, this particular setting to me is so rich and so spiritual in a sense in this world. And it makes me think too, that like if we were in a severe setting, if we were in a setting with the scrubby storm tatter, tattered hardwoods that she's contrasting the scene with. If we were in a more austere or uncomfortable setting um, and you're brought forth with that kind of choice, it'd be an easy like, no, I don't feel safe. I feel uncomfortable. But if you're in a place where you are invited and you are welcomed and you are honored and you are shown sovereignty, you are shown that you, uh, you're shown the sense of safety then I feel like that invites the person to be more open to that possibility, be more open to, to exploring decisions, to admitting guilt, to, to opening up to those choices and also seeing those pathways a little bit more clearly. But the fact that he, he can't let go, that he ultimately doesn't go there because I feel like the way she sets it up makes you feel like, oh, maybe he can, there's hope, there's hope, there's hope. And then when he doesn't, it's so heartbreaking in contrast to what we've been set, how we've been set up in the scene. And it all also gave me this really sad feeling like if he can't turn around now, I don't think he ever will. Um, I would love Jenny Wirtz to prove me wrong, but that was, that was the hopelessness I felt at the end of it, but also just the power of the scene for me. Yeah. I want to say one thing about this and it's something that Jenny Wirtz does 
throughout both Chips of Merrier and Warhost of Vastmark. And that is he keeps going back to uh, Talcor and the, the river where the battle happened at the end of the first book, Curse of the Mistwraith. This one of the most visceral, just awful battle scenes I've ever read. And I am so glad that she keeps going back to this and what it means and the impact that it has on these characters. It's reverberating this very significant, and I think in a lot of fantasy series, there'd be a battle, uh, you know, epic battle happens and then you move on and you never really reference that again. What Wirtz is doing here is going back to it again and again and again, and she is drawing out all these repercussions. The echoes of this atrocity, of this tragedy, keep uh, rearing their head in, in throughout both the, the following volumes. And I really appreciate that uh, because it is so much a part of how entrenched Lysera is because he has this narrative about what happened there. And you could argue part of it may be because of the, the mistrafe, the curse that's on him that, that is driving his uh, recalcitrance, or maybe it's something about his inherited gift of justice, uh, which is, all seems to be digging him in even deeper because no, he has to have justice no matter what, and he's ready to sacrifice everything in order to get this justice, his own marriage, his uh, relationships, uh, so many lives. Uh, and, and he feels that this is... Uh, I think he has still convinced himself that he's in the right here, right? Um, so I, I, I really love, appreciate that we keep going back to this uh, very significant event in, in the uh, the history of this this series and really examining the consequences, the repercussions from it. Oh, that was so beautifully said, Philip. I'm so glad you said that. It, it makes me think too about like, you know, in real life, I feel like I see this, uh, the older that you get, and even just looking at some loved ones I've seen who are older than me, the more that they replay like some kind of grudging memory, like some kind of angry memory in their head. And the more that they play it out in their head and play it out in their head and play it out in their head, it becomes more ingrained and more ingrained. And it takes over in a way to where it's like harder and harder to let go. And I feel like we're seeing that happen to Icer, but also it's, it almost takes itself away from truth more and more every time too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I just, but I love the way you said that. Cause I think you're right though. And then from a narrative perspective, like just the way she just keeps on bringing you back to things that happened in that first book. Yeah. And the, the repercussions and resonances and ramifications of traumatic events. Like we see how traumatic events in our world shape us and have ramifications and repercussions for years, generations to come. Mm -hmm. And Philip, I, you know, I think you have a good point in that a lot of fantasy writing, we sometimes gloss over violence as action and we have the big action set piece and, oh, it was terrible, so-and-so died and I will mourn. And it, it's um, emotional in the moment and then and now we move on and the hero is now on this part of their journey that it it becomes almost quite episodic like a serial that and next week this thing is going to happen but some of the most powerful stories that we read there are elements and traumas and actions and sequences that reverberate through and will continually crop up in, in different moments and will build upon and can skew, as, as you pointed out, Joanna, they, Lysir each time is buying more and more into this. He's becoming more and more entrenched. And it becomes harder to rescue someone from that point because mm -hmm. they, they are digging their own hole. They, they are forming their own reality. And if you try to adjust that, it's an attack on their worldview. Yeah. And I think, you know, in the modern day, we, we see this in action, particularly on social media, mm -hmm. that people, people become very entrenched to a particular perspective. And as soon as you start nibbling away at the foundations of that, that threatens to bring the whole thing down. And then 
they will have to look at all of their actions in light of everything that they have done, but without the protection of that ideology or the self-rationalization that justified it, that the ends didn't justify the means. And that, that can be devastating to the sense of self. Mm. So even, even in fantasy, even in the, this fantasy that seems fo- so far removed from our world, there are very strong parallels with what these characters are going through to, to our world and, and lessons that we can learn and ways to, to think about it and reevaluate even mistakes that we've made in our own life. And, you know, that, that's the power of that sequence with Lysir for me, because how many, how many fake realities have I built up? How many justifications have I made for actions where I have framed it? No, this was the only possible way that I could have done this in order to protect myself from the truth that I have hurt people in the past. Yeah. I I have to reevaluate myself. Yeah. And not only that, but you know, it seems like Lysir, he, he seems, it seems to me like he's almost in wonder when he first arrives in that setting. And when he leaves, he's like, Oh, it's all set up. It's all set up against me. He almost, it plants suspicion in him towards everything else. And we'll see that come through later on in the story as well. So it's interesting because like we get we can get so grounded into our beliefs that if somebody even just gently <laughs> challenges us or something, suddenly they're the enemy too, you know, uh, just the way that that can play out. And I think your point there was perfect. He becomes poisoned against it. And from that point on, can no longer perceive it the way that we know that anyone else on there is still going to see exactly the same wondrous thing, but he can't see it anymore. And he can't think about that anymore. And it actually shifts the reality. Um, and it's an incredibly powerful sequence. And I, I think at some point I might try and do a whole video just on that one particular thing. But um, shall we move on to something else? Because I appreciate like there, there's so much to talk about in this book. Yeah. Um, that we could talk for a very long time. But I appreciate that, you know, Philip's old and tired and he needs his, his rest. <laughs> I'm glad that we spent some time on that though, because that really was my favorite scene in the in the whole book. It's gorgeous. Well, what did you think about Lady Talith and her her entire uh, jaunt in the story? Oh man, so that's what I was talking about. I mean, <laughs> there's a lot to say there. Uh, I'll let Philip start this time. Oh, okay. Well, I was surprised she was one of. Uh, two characters, maybe even three or four, but, but definitely one of the principal characters where I was surprised to find myself feeling a bit of sympathy for her. Uh, and it uh, was fascinating to see this character who had been, I, I won't say she was just a stereotype of a spoiled rich woman, but she was definitely a spoiled rich woman. And uh, she was very self-centered uh, and, and remains so for the most part, but the the fact that uh, she has gained or, or allowed herself to eventually see Arathon in a different light as a result of her captivity and spending time with him and realizing, oh, he's not just the 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 monster that Lyser says he is. He actually, you know, maybe even, and she tries to talk to Lysera about it, and he will have nothing, especially after the episode we were just talking about. He will, it, it is such a difficult scene. She is so vulnerable in that scene. First of all, she's literally naked. Um, and so that, I mean, she's physically vulnerable, but emotionally vulnerable as well. Uh, she is so bared in that scene. <laughs> and I felt for her because she actually was trying to do the right thing in that moment and uh, had allowed herself to build empathy uh, for for Arathon. And to see the way Lyser uh, treats her as a result of that, uh, essentially saying, well, you're going to be just for show my queen, but I'm not going to touch you. I'm not going to go anywhere near you. I'm not going to talk to you. Uh, and and for her to have tried to make this sacrifice on behalf of Lyser, because she believes it's in his interest to understand, no, Arathon isn't what you think, it's this. And 
and this will will ease your burden. So she's doing it for for Lyser and 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 more than even perhaps than for Arathon. And still, his response is to crush her. Uh, and I just feel so so bad for her. And I cut. I kind of felt bad for for Talith. I was surprised to find uh, that. Oh, I uh, horrible for her. I did. I actually am kind of proud of myself. I saw a couple things coming, and one was the fact that she when she thought she was escaping uh, with the help of the uh, the blind uh, the rope maker guy. I forget his name, but um, I, I pretty much knew as soon as that conversation happened. Oh, I know who's going to pop by at the end of this trip. And yep, sure enough, Arathon opens the door and says, welcome, you know. <laughs> so I, I actually saw that one coming and I was like, yes, I got one right. You know, Oh, I'm so gullible. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you, Philip. Good for you. Yeah. yeah so um, a couple of things. I have so much I want to say about this whole part. So that scene with uh, with Taylor and with Lysera, Second favorite scene in the whole entire book. Wow. <laughs> honestly, honestly, those are the two scenes that are my favorites. That's operatic, that scene. It is. Yes, yeah. yes. Well, that's the one I was thinking about specifically. Like, okay, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you how in a second. But I first want to say that, the, again, like going back to even before she has the fake escape, I feel like Wurtz does such an amazing job with the showing rather than telling because you see how how many ways that Arathon is not the, not the villain that she thought he was mm -hmm. like all the little things that he does around the ship, the way he interacts with his crew, the way that they don't follow for her sexy tricks. And <laughs> like, there are so many things, the way that she saw that their, their loyalty to him, but her relationship, his there. relationship with Janelle's children uh, is another one. Yes, she she sees that. That's yeah. another important part, right? She sees that. Or Janelle. Janelle. Sorry, I said Janelle. Yeah. yeah. Janelle. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I knew you were talking about, but yeah, he, she sees how all of that plays out and how that. Um, who was the guy? I'm so sorry. The captain who was with Janelle, who is. Oh, oh! You mean the uh, the guy who was punished by the the Duke Brancian uh, and became was trying to get revenge on on Arathon and ended up. Becoming, uh, what's, what's his, his name? name? Was it Farrick? I think that's right. That sounds right. There's a chapter yeah. named after him. Uh, yeah, yeah, that character. She sees the dynamic with him as well. Like all of these different things, it's just set up perfectly for her to be a witness to to what's really happening on that ship, what's really happening with Arathon. And yeah, it's <laughs> that whole entire uh, deceit was pretty funny. But the scene where Lysir is unwrapping his present, you know, <laughs> I laughed. I actually, I don't know if it was intended to be funny, but I laughed out loud because he's, I guess there was some question of like whether they should have wine to celebrate or whatever. And he's like, no, no wine. I just want to unwrap my present. I missed you so much, my love. And he does genuinely love her, but like they start getting it on. And then she's like, and he says something about horrible about earth on. She's like, but actually, well, actually, and she keeps bringing up the well actuallys. And there was a line where it said, and they were going to need the wine after all. And that was like the first <laughs> <laughs> I laughed so hard because I could hear the music. It was like this beautiful, like love song or something like this beautiful orchestration of music, just this gorgeous love scene. And then you, you just hear the first, like, you know, <laughs> a little musical counterpoint coming in and it's like, no, no, forget. and then trying to start the music swelling again. And then the yes, yes, I loved it. Yeah. It was brilliant. It was brilliant and so heartbreaking again, but absolutely brilliant. Because, and again, I think you've, you've both pointed out like the, the essence of this, because we see it with um, Tharic as well of prejudging yeah. Arathon and then seeing the evidence and doubting the evidence that you, you, because you read the evidence in light of your prejudice. And it's only through repeated exposure to the fact that, well, Arathon is clearly a villain. He's clearly a pirate. He's clearly evil. And they're all in on it. And it's this vast conspiracy that everyone, this is, this is becoming harder and harder to create a giant conspiracy that everyone is in on and they're all acting all the time. 
And Talith shows that strength of character that she she go, she realizes, no, I'm wrong. But she still plots to escape. It's not like she suddenly is, oh, Arathon's wonderful. I'm on Arathon's side now. She wants to get back to Lysera. She loves Lysera. And yeah, being left unguarded in a hut and, you know, Arathon tripping off you sort of, She's she's so good at political maneuvering and didn't see basic human psychology coming into this of Man. he played you. He played you like a fool. Um but when she gets back, and it was you you articulated that beautifully about the comedy of this scene of uh Lysere, again being self-absorbed and thinking of Talith as an extension of himself, as something he owns. And this romantic moment, these two lovers coming together, and she's like, well, actually, now that you mention it, you go, no, is not the time. But then that heartbreaking, that heartbreaking moment where Lysaire looks at her and again, he has to believe that she has been corrupted because otherwise, how could she be defending this devil? Because Arathon must be a devil. Arathon must be evil. And if she is now defending him, why would she be doing that? And we see him in real time create the rationale and justification for why he is allowed to put her aside. And he frames it, in, and this is going to cost me because you are my love. You go, if you actually loved her, you would listen. But he can't. And it's, it's both the, the curse and the position that he has put himself in, and he now can no longer back down. Yeah, he, and he, we like see him be forced further and further along that path. He seems yeah. to translate everything into a sign of his virtue. So this, this denial of talent, it hurts me so much, but I'm so committed to justice. And the more it hurts me, the more obviously I am committed to justice and I'm going to see it through, you know, and he, he interprets everything in that way, um, which is um, kind of scary actually um and you encounter that kind of thing in the real world too this this self-righteousness where uh you know uh, oh i'm going to have to hurt other people but it's for their good you know um that sort of mentality so yeah yeah i can understand it from talith's perspective though because it's like if you see that this per that my loved one my fiance or no, actually they're married at this point that my husband who i love more than anything is going to war for an unjust cause and is going to risk his life as well as the lives of so many people just knowing what's at stake behind this deception that he's falling for like i can understand her wanting to try to convince him and holding her ground even though of course she loves him i mean it's because she loves him i should put it that way That's no right. but joanna the next morning could have been that they could have she could have waited even even <laughs> half an hour, 45 minutes later, you know, lying back, uh, having the glass of wine to refresh afterwards. That's when you have the conversation. Yeah. Bad timing. <laughs> I don't know. Well, you know, I have to say, though, that I, I don't remember exactly how this worked out. Maybe it was through the sorcerers. I'm not sure, actually. Maybe you two can refresh my memory. But I remember that I was so grateful that Arathon actually knew what was happening, that he was informed that that Talith had that revelation, even though it costed her her marriage, essentially. He was aware of that and it broke his heart. It broke his heart. Arathon did not want that for Talith, but I was glad he was he knew because I felt like he needs to know. He needs to know what this woman put herself through. Poor yeah. thing. But I don't know how he knew. Like, I, I wasn't really clear. You're correct. It was through Seth Fear being able to see everything and reporting it to Dakar. And, and he, that's that's more or less how he found out. So the sorcerer can see everything. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's specifically Seth Fear. Okay. Yeah. Not not all of the sorcerers. It's because he's... Uh, he has that, yeah. that bond with the, the planet. Well, um, do you want to talk about the... 
Well, it, there's a, a sequence I want to talk about, which again is people acting in a way that they think is justified and yet is barbaric. And it follows what happens to the survivors of the, the first encounter with uh, Arathon's forces in, mm-hmm. in the last one, where he sets up his, his ambush. And there are survivors. I want to talk about what happens to those survivors because I think that's a big moment. But yeah. uh, do you want to talk about the, the battle first or slaughter, really? Because one of, the, one of the things that impressed me about this was Arathon w- was constantly looking for ways to avoid conflict, to avoid the spending of lives, to avoid the waste of lives. And then we had that whole time where he spent looking at walking all over the landscape, learning the land, learning the strategic points of the land and being aware of what was available to him and the best way to defend himself because he's never looking for offense. And then we have that beach landing in the cove and Arathon sets up one of the most brutal, cold, calculated, slaughtering of an army and he doesn't use magic makes a point of no shadows being used no magic being used this was cold strategic clinical using the terrain to your advantage slaughtering your enemy and it was it was brutal it was hard it was harsh and yet we know he's the defender he didn't pick this fight and he'd even scribed to try and find a way. What can I do to prevent even more lives being lost? Right. And we know that the scrying was manipulated and, and sent awry. But he believes that by killing all of these men, he can send a message to Lysir to back down. And that will ultimately save more people's lives. So a utilitarian gamble by killing 500 brutally, you save 40,000 or more if you count yeah. the, the, the native people to Vasmar. Uh, so he's trying to save all his lives. That's the calculation that's coming from his, his compassion. Uh, but it's, of course, it, there's a paradox here because it's an act of compassion that involves horrible slaughter of people which obviously <laughs> tortures arathon horribly uh, but he knows that is the that's the way forward of course he i suppose he could have tried to go out to sea and, and you know run away or something other but we could argue back and forth about other options i suppose but the real point is that he was trying to save 40,000 by sacrificing 500 and it, and it gutted him. Um, and so that's, uh, yeah, um, that's really tough. Uh, and I don't know, I have no idea whether I think that was, <laughs> uh, I mean, strategically, of course it came off the way he planned. Um, uh, but in terms of, uh, that calculation, I know, I know, I don't think of myself as a utilitarianist, uh, utilitarian uh, um, person uh, in, in most respects. There's an emotional component that comes into these kinds of decisions that I feel like is part of the morality of it all, like just killing all those people. And some of them were wounded on the beach and you're just having your men, you know, finish them off. And, and then he gently nurses the 25 they don't even know it's him. They just they think, oh, who's this nice little fellow who's who's uh, who's so expertly mending us? And he was doing it all for a purpose. So he was using those twenty five. But I think even then, the tenderness with which he was trying to heal them was genuine. Um, so it's like he's having to fight. He's put in this untenable position, I think, of trying to be compassionate by being merciless. And it's, it's almost breaks him. That's well said. It's interesting. Cause like you were saying that you don't feel like you normally are utilitarian. And I feel like much of fantasy is a critique on utilitarianism. And mm-hmm. this particular, it's interesting what you were saying too, about Arathon and how he has, he feels he has to do this out of compassion. He has to make a utilitarian decision as it being more compassionate than otherwise. And yet it seems to me like the curse 
him being inclined towards compassion and him at the same time wanting to destroy uh, his half-brother is such a mismatch compared to his Lysir being like inclined towards just justice and wanting to kill him. <laughs> Arathon, it seems like, even though it, obviously there are consequences for Lysir as well, it seems like a more of a misalignment for Arathon and the decisions he has to make. Because it it is brutal what he does. And, you know, war is hell. Like, books, films, TV shows go go on and on about the brutality of war. And that's what we see here. We see the slaughter. But after nursing these people back to health and having been guided by the, the scrying, the vision, that if these people speak to Lysair, there's a good chance Lysair will stop the campaign. And again, we're frustrated in that. Thank you, Deegan. Good move. Oh, Deegan. <laughs> oh, it was so heartbreaking. Good. And, but again, Deegan isn't doing it out of, you know, being mean, being that. Do, he's doing it out of loyalty. He's doing it to protect morale. Thinking he's he doing knows it. best. Thinking that he knows best. Right? I, I, something that we see the, uh, the sorceresses do a lot is a lot of their plans are, you know, because they know better and those meddlesome sorcerers out there, like, oh, they're, they're just terrible. We know best. We see how all of these different characters are acting in what they believe to be the best interest of them, their cause, the people they believe in, the people they're friends with, the people they love. They are acting to do the best, to be the best. None of them think of themselves as being evil. And yet we see the consequences of their actions having these terrible, terrible repercussions. When Lysair walks out onto that field of battle, so confident in his ability, and causes the death of his own men. Yeah. Yeah. And again, can't, can't accept that. It's, oh, it was because it was a trick because uh, I, he made me do this. Yeah. Arathon played a trick, and because I did that thing, it, that's what caused the death of them. Not my fault. Not my not failure. The fact that, not the fact I was the one who attacked first, that I'm the one invading. Yeah. Like when we were little kids, and we, we get in trouble with along with a, a sibling, and it's like, oh, no, she made me do it, you know? Exactly. Yeah. So... And again, coming down to that, that we we see all of these different characters. And, you know, Philip, you had mentioned earlier on about uh, Dakar changing his mind about Arathon. He's, and, but you said it perfectly. He starts to change his mind. He starts to challenge the assumptions that he has made. He, he still is fighting it. He has this prophecy and he's holding it and he's not telling, right? Because he's not convinced. And yet... We see at the the end when Dakar saves Arathon from the arrow. Yeah, that we know Dakar has has turned a corner in this relationship, but it's not like oh Arathon, he's awesome. I love him. He's my best friend. Right. It it's not a volte face. It's <laughs> my my premise was wrong. I need to rethink this. And that level of maturity of thought is, is so difficult for, for most of us to sort of go admitting that you are wrong and that you need to rethink something. That, that takes a strength of character sometimes that we can find it very hard to find in ourselves because it is easier to believe that we are right and the other people are wrong. And if only they could see it, they would realize how right I am. Yeah. I feel like uh, that comes through in a couple of storylines too. Like when I think of Lorenda, I, I feel like she mm -hmm. kind of tries to pretend that she's more in control than she is without wanting to reveal so much. And then same with Dakar too. He doesn't want to, he has to face um, whether he's been wrong about certain assumptions all along. I feel like a lot of characters face that in this story actually. Sure, yeah. A lot of them, actually Theric as well. And um Julius and uh and gosh what's her name the mother Jill Jeunesse. Jeunesse. 
Thank you. It's an S. Yeah. Several of the characters, they all have to kind of come to terms with facing that they might have been wrong about things. Yep. 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 Yeah, so true. Um, that moment, by the way, is the other one that I actually thought was going to happen, that Dakar was going to get in the way of the arrow. And I was like, yes, I got two things right in one book. It's a miracle. <laughs> well, what I loved about that, sorry, go ahead. I didn't no, 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 no. Tell me what you loved about it. No, what I loved about that was how that was tied in not only to his prophecy, but also to uh, the Prime's prophecy as well. Uh -huh. Like how it's like two clashing prophecies or two yeah. prophecies. Like it was that was amazing. I, I just thought that was so clever. And you know, we we've talked about, uh, a lot about it, but through this book, we keep seeing more and more examples, different examples uh, of how the magic is working, how it is being manipulated, what the limitations are on this, because we see the the sheer power that the the brotherhood have like the level of power they have is stunning but we see the limitation on it mm -hmm. in terms of that the needing of consent the the laws that they bind themselves to or are bound to and we see that uh moriel and the the enchantresses again they they have their power their way of doing things but getting the waystone back the the great waystone and it's we're we're going to do this, and we're going to we have this brilliant sequence. And it's did you ever ask? <laughs> and it it in all of the centuries that they've been missing it, it never once occurred to them to go. Can we have can we have our ball back, please? Yeah, but she never yeah. acts like that too, right? To the prime, doesn't Lorenda act like she had some big conquest with getting it? Back? I have accomplished my mission. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, she yeah. can't admit it. She has so much pride. No, it's so wonderful what Seth Beer says. I was wondering when you ladies were going to ask for this, you know? Right. Yeah. And how about the deception with the centaur? <laughs> it was just wild. Yeah. So much deception and trickery. So, but, and again, it, the narrativization, the narrativization of events to suit the point of view that you want to project. And so, yes, I've accomplished this great thing. I have recovered this. How did you do it? I, I said, could I have it back, please? <laughs> <laughs> but but again, the the blindness of people, it's they have taken it and they're too powerful. We can't take it back from them. It's like, and then we find out they never asked. Hmm. The assumptions made about other people. And even with Jeunesse and Farrakh, there her and his feelings about who Arathon is. And constantly having their their point of view about Arathon challenged and still not sort of buying fully into a, a, what I think would be more in line with the reader perspective where we see Arathon so truly because that's the perspective of the narrative but mm. they are still shaped by what has happened to them what what they fear can happen to the to the children to the twins and, and so uh, Brancian as well the duke mm. His view of Arathon changes at the very end too. Um, but are there are there any other moments? Because I this has been a really fun conversation. I really enjoyed this, and thank you both for it. But are there any other elements or or moments that you wanted to talk about? I think I'm good. Yeah, um, I, I think I would just I would just add to that last point, which is just it seems to me a lot of these conflicting or deceptive ideas about. Arathon or about others in this particular story, they often happen in the character's own minds, especially, well, with Dakar, that's a special exception because he is in close proximity with Arathon the whole entire time. But a lot of them, it's happening when they're apart. So like when with the, the prime, with the sisterhood, you know, they're having this perception of the waystone, like you said, the whole story until they actually confront set the set bearer or to the fellowship and say hey can i have it you know all of these deceptions and i feel like that's so true to human nature like we 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 fall into these traps of deception when we're not actually confronting and asking for truth when it could be that simple and i'm even thinking like i'm also even thinking about marrier because it seemed like once arathon came to marrier he changed their perceptions of him when he was there when he left and then lysir came 
suddenly mm -hmm. the conspiracy theories started to <laughs> pop up again. And it's like, does Erdogan just need to make himself available everywhere for people to see him? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I don't know. It's just something that came to mind when you were talking about that, AP. But other than that, no, I, I think we covered a lot of really great points in this story. Nemesis? I am uh, content. I think we had a wonderful conversation. It's interesting to see how Lysair is a expert marketer. Um, he's really good at the propaganda. Not such a great military campaigner, however. We've seen so far he has been outsmarted drastically by Arathon at every turn. Uh, but he keeps using his charisma. Uh, so we'll see what happens in the next arc. I am very eager to find out. Well, I, all that remains then is for me to thank both of my guests, including my nemesis. Yes, thank you, Philip. And <laughs> Joanna, thank you so much. Um, you. And for those of you still watching, thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. And I will see you in the next one.